stopgap. Well, Porsche's my dream car. He was a film star. Well, you had one until your wife sold it for you. <laughs> Bang and stop and stop. Bang and stop. This memorial was erected by a wealthy fan. And for some reason, it reads like the back label of a bad bottle of wine. An individual struggling, struggling in this, in this huge, huge land, land of, of infinite, infinite promise, promise and, and many races. races. Now that would That's be the Shiraz. Uh, we're on a break from Wine Oz. This is a motoring moment. This I know what this is. This is a translation from the Japanese, isn't it? It's like, it reads like the instruction leaflets of an early uh, Kawasaki. <laughs> well, this is, this is a Japanese memorial and a Japanese yeah, exactly. bloke put it up. Maybe that's it. He was a rebel without a cause, James. He was a rebel without an airbag, unfortunately. Well, let's go and have a memorial hot dog. Right, back to wine. We're in search of a California guru, someone I'm hoping can get James over his fear of terroir. I hope that what he will show you is that he's got various different soils and I know that you get all up uppity about the French terroir and oh it is all in the soil and all this kind of stuff but give him a chance okay to see if he can persuade you that the different soils on his property create completely different flavours in the wine. Oh a dog. Here's a dog James. Yes. Hello mate. We're actually here to meet a man James, a revered Rhone Valley grape expert John Alban. Glad you're here. This must be James. Uh, your job. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello, John. Sorry, I was delayed by your dog. Yes, they have that effect on folks. Well, I think we should start in the vineyard because, as Oz knows, we make wine out of grapes and they come out of the vineyard originally. You know Oz from Oz has obviously told John I'm a complete numpty. I need to wow him over with some wine facts. What grapes are those? This is Syrah. So that's Syrah. So that's a Rhone Valley grape, isn't it? That's right. Very good. You do know something. Great. We grow two whites. Can you name two white rones? Uh, yes, I can. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, no, I can't actually. Uh, and that's what you get trying to show off, fatted. John takes me back to basics with an explanation as to why the Californian climate is, is so California suited to winemaking. But if this is April here, and this is October here, is that in Europe, the climate ascends and descends roughly like that. In California, the climate tends to run more like that. And so you have a period much hotter in Europe, but far more significantly, you have this area. And this area in California means that we can keep ripening and ripening and ripening without any fear of frost, and in most areas, almost no fear of precipitation. It won't rain. This is the key part. And that is a wine fact. If James can grasp that simple sketch, maybe John can get him to accept the French terroir concept he so hates. What I want to show you is if you look under these rows, you'll see that this soil is full of rather large cobble-sized rocks. And these cobbles are very important because they're not just on the surface, they run throughout the soil profile, which means a couple of things. When the sun arrives in the spring and the soil starts to warm up, well, this rock warms up pretty darn fast in the, in the sunlight. The roots detect the heat and the roots tell the vine, wake up, it's spring. But we're gonna walk down about 15 rows. These cobbles disappear and because of that, that soil heats up much slower. Maybe I need a drink. This bloke is talking about the significance of stones and I'm finding it interesting. Let's walk down here because we don't have to go very far. Well, obviously not, because you're an American. You'd have driven if it was more than 20 years. And since I'm a Californian... Just a stone's throw away, there is a very different structure to the soil. Whatever cobbles were there are fractured and broken down into rocks, and because of it, more soil can accumulate, and these vines are picked three or four weeks later. Does that mean you're becoming a bit like the French now? Are you going to, st are you going to use the word terroir at any second? At this point, do you believe it could make a difference in the quality of the wine where you grow the grapes. Oddly enough, uh, listening to you talk about it, I believe entirely that it does because you've been quite scientific and sort of post-enlightenment about it. But when you speak to the French, they run around in smocks saying, my grandfather, dad here, and the local peasants are all fat, and it makes a difference, but it clearly doesn't. You know, but I think sense. you've already pointed out that you do believe that the soil the vine is grown in can make a difference. The climate that the vine is grown in can make a difference. Come up with a new term. 
and I will embrace it. What should we call it? Fluff. Fluff. Very good. At last, someone has got James to accept the concept of terroir. And now, as I said, I need a drink. Well, you're going to get two. It smells very good. Up. You've got to taste the difference black. between the wines made from the vines in that ultra-rocky and in the mildly rocky vineyard. These wines come from the same year, they're made in the same way. The only difference is the stony soil. Right, I'm going to go for the big boulders first. God, that's good. You need no more description than that. That's <coughs> adequate for me. Right? You've now got small gravel. Right. But this smells warmer more chocolatey and hotter actually wow that's the best glass of wine i've ever had uh, by miles that louder? seriously that is just remarkable have you tried this Actually, no, get your own. It's really fantastic. So you're going to ask me to describe the differences. This is smoother. And the, the, the difference isn't that subtle, actually. And it is the same sort of taste, but this one is more chocolatey. It's easier to drink, and it's, it's more uh, liberal. No, really, that is the best glass of wine I've ever had. How much is it, a bottle, roughly? That's about uh, $80. So is it? What is that... Uh in your system. So, to us, by the time it gets to us, probably 50 quid? 60, probably. 60 quid, that's quite expensive. I'm sorry about that. I was hoping I was going to be able to say, and it's only eight pounds. But it's not, it's at least 60. It's rather more well, what do you know? James May, the people's champion of affordable wine, is now panting to pay 60 quid for a single bottle. I leave John's vineyard happy that I'm not the wine dunce he thought I was, but worried that I might be on the way to becoming a wine ponds and annoyed that Oz's stupid schedule means we're back on the road. As I predicted, that man produces an extremely good wine. And because you've arranged for me to have to drive some of this afternoon, I enjoyed a small taste of it, which I then had to spit out. So as usual, you've arranged for me to go and see one of your posh mates on the pretense of educating me about wine and really using me as a chauffeur. Deny it. Guilty as charged. After that lesson in quantum wine theory, we need to get back into the spirit of the region. So, we're off to see one of the new generation of Rhone Rangers. Ten miles inland and 1,300 feet up, the Saxon vineyard is run by a genuine, rootin' tootin', gun totin' grape grower. Justin Smith is my kind of winemaker. He's under 50, he wears sunglasses and a pork pie hat, and looks a bit like Pete Doherty, but does something useful. The shotgun is because it's starling season, and even rebel winemakers have to protect their precious Syrah grapes. Do I look like the beginning of Dad's army? And we're just scaring the birds, not shooting them. And this clip is just the editor being funny, because that's not a starling, it's an eagle. No, James, it's a turkey buzzard. Oh dear, oh dear. Now, I want to try these wines to make sure he's not all style and no content. So this is a uh, Rhone blend. Uh, Fairly equal parts, uh, Grenache, Syrah, and Morvedre. I'm so. getting a real perfume off it, almost sort of rose petal -y perfume, but rich strawberry, raspberry fruit as well. It's rather good, actually. It's very good. Thank you very much. Well, a reveille, totally. maybe, but Justin makes seriously good wine. In fact, Saxon wines are a hit with the critics and are pretty popular in shishi Hollywood hangouts. How much is this? 80 pounds. Can I have a bit more? We'll try this one. What's this got in it? It's uh, mainly Syrah. That's the planting out there. It's just sort of more funky, slightly more sort of meaty kind of nose. See, I think it's got Brazil nut shells in it. I also think it has laminated um, photo quality inkjet paper. <laughs> Is there a mood here in Paso Robles of sort of a maverick, slightly rebellious mood against the mainstream of California wine. What's fun about Paso Robles right now is that we are kind of doing our own thing and finding our own way. It's not like we're following a tradition that's been set or anything. It's like we're, uh, we're seeing what works here. It's, it's, all, it's all brand new and so uh, we figure, hey, might as well have some fun doing it. There is building up a sense 